please subscribe and don't forget to press the bell icon to get notified whenever we upload a new video. Welcome back, and it is time now for our fast take today. And we're joining me is special guest Dennis Berman. Also I'm ready. One of those old-fashioned newspapers. We're a digital platform. <laughs> yeah, digital of the future. <laughs> anyway, speaking of digital platforms of the future, we begin with crypto mania today, as Kyle Bass just called it. The Texas hedge funder is warning that a whole bunch of people, quote, are going to lose a lot of money, end quote, on initial coin offerings. He basically called frauds. Also, former IMF chief economist Ken Rogoff in a new column says Bitcoin will eventually collapse, Dennis. Separately, we learned that people are hacking companies' Amazon servers, not for their data now, but just for the computing power to mine Bitcoin. What do you call all of this? Uh, well, of course, there are going to be some people who get hurt and some people who uh, try to do some terrible things. But the idea is here to stay. Blockchain, <laughs> cryptocurrencies, the Bitcoin. All of itself. it. Well, let's start, let's start with ICOs, Kelly. OK, so people will lose money. Some of these will absolutely be failures. But the interesting thing to think about. Is so you're not staunchly against them. No, in that they sort of they dislodge the venture capitalists from the whole equation and they dislodge the IPO process itself. Interesting. They may well be banned. But in the meantime, I, I, I'd be willing to bet that some of these things actually turn out to No. Maybe not no. all. No. More than zero. I, uh, may, I will, not more than five. Not more than five. Okay, I'll take the over. <laughs> okay, <laughs> next. <laughs> it's a perfect opportunity for a tech giant to show how it's helping humanity. Remember those Wi-Fi balloons from Google parent company Alphabet? They would seem to be a perfect way to restore connectivity to storm-ravaged Puerto Rico. And yet the company says those balloons can't do it alone and need a telecom partner cellular network to work. Now, AT&T and T-Mobile, apparently, Dennis, are not up to the task without a software update. I don't know why this isn't moving forward. It seems like such a shame right now. Seems like a pretty smart idea. We all have our issues with Google right now. But if this can work, this should be a standard procedure for basically the whole emergency apparatus in this country. Yes, and it's already worked in Peru. Right. So when the storm comes and you can get those balloons up, like that to me seems like progress of humanity. And if any of those named telecom companies or another one can step up to the plate right now and, and turn on whatever needs to be turned on for this to work, it would make a huge difference and set a standard. Absolutely. But soon we'll have all have those updates on our phones. So when the time comes, perhaps it'll be able to connect work. directly. Yes. We'll see. Makes all sense. right. Finally, a chicken tender button and a prime through like a drive through for prime members. Those are just a couple of the joking, not joking ideas from Carl's Jr. and a new marketing campaign aimed at Amazon. Now, I actually think there's some merit to these, Dennis, uh, but will these cheeky ideas actually help sales at Carl's Jr.? Um, well, we're talking about them now, so I guess Marge, I don't know what the overlap is between CNBC and Carl's Jr. Fairly uh, good. Okay, but uh, I'd say generally not. I would say that as well. It's What I love about it is it, as a marketing campaign, it's brilliant, is actually throwing ideas out there that maybe Amazon, because we know they like to do quirky things too, would take them up on brilliant as a way to sell more burgers and, right. and chicken tenders right now, and I'm not I so totally sure. agree, Kelly. If I'm thinking about lunch, I don't care about Amazon and Carl's Jr. corporate synergies. Okay, wait Just till give me get, a McRib or whatever they wait have. Wait till we get a chicken tender button on, the floor, on your floor at the journal. I'm, You're going to be eating Carl's Jr. every day. I'm ready. I'm ready. <laughs> Dennis, thank you very much. Thank you. It's been a pleasure. Time now for a CNBC News update. Let's get over to Sue Herrera. Sue. Hi, Kelly. Thank you so much. We're going to start this hour with those Southern California and Northern California wildfires, a wind-driven wildfire sweeping along the outskirts of a Southern California subdivision. The blaze erupted late this morning in the Anaheim Hills and moved rapidly through the hills and canyons in Orange County. It now stands at 2,000 acres. At least six homes are burning in Anaheim. An evacuation center is being set up in the downtown community center and schools are closed. Meantime, residents in Northern California are beginning to see firsthand the devastation left behind by multiple wildfires there. Officials estimating more than 1,500 structures have been destroyed in at least eight communities. We are just learning at least one person has died. Two others suffered serious injuries. Some 20,000 people have been evacuated. The parents of Aurora, Colorado theater shooter James Holmes sharing what they've learned about mental health at a symposium in Pennsylvania which focused on the warning signs of mental illness. The question I get the most from people who want to talk to me is, how do I know if it's just not being a teenager? And the one sentence answer that I could give you is, it doesn't go away. That is the news update. Kelly, back downtown to you. That is so tough. Uh, thank you, Sue. You got it. Sue Herrera back at headquarters.
All right, back to business. Demand for private jets has been slowing and prices have fallen for three straight years due to oversupply. Up next, the CEO of Brazilian aircraft maker Embraer Aviation joins us with his take on the business jet industry right after this. The national holiday known as Golden Week in China is wrapping up and people are back at work. It's typically seven days, but this year people got an extra day off because the holiday overlapped with the Mid-Autumn Festival. The National Tourism Administration estimates more than 700 million Chinese traveled over the holiday and spent the equivalent of 89 billion U.S. dollars. Golden Week is looked at by investors as an opportunity for bumper earnings, especially this time around because of that extra day. But the NTA in China says the number of tourists staying in hotels dropped this year. New home sales in China also dropped, and revenue from Macau was just slightly higher versus last year. Some of the Macau stocks are lower today. As a result, Galaxy and Sands China down 2.5 to 3.5%. Now to business travel. A new forecast just out from Honeywell says it will be at least next year before we see an uptick in business jet deliveries. The forecast was released ahead of the Business Aviation Convention about to start in Las Vegas, and that's where we find our own Phil LeBeau. And in a first on CNBC interview, Michael Amalfitano, who is president and CEO of Embraer executive jets. Wow, look at that chessboard, Phil. Uh, Kelly, not very often you get to be in a $55 million plane, but I'm here with Michael Amalfitano, Embraer right, Aviation Phil. CEO. Tell me about this jet. The lineage is Yeah, beautiful. the lineage is our ultra-large aircraft, $55 million. It's uh, considered the home away from home. It allows for uh, our cu customers to have a bespoke uh, interior experience just like they would at their house. Five cabin zones, does all the missions that a, an executive or a high net worth individual or a corporate flight department would ask for and more. And it does it in style. It sure uh, does. Kelly brought up a point in the beginning. Honeywell's out with its forecast yes. for, for aviation or business jet deliveries this year. A bit of a plateau, if you will. And everybody's saying, look, we're, we're almost 10 years since the recession. When do we see business jet, corporate jet sales really kick into high gear? Well, what you have to realize, we're already seeing signs for the strengthening uh, marketplace. Our forecast is calls for 7,500 units over the next 10 years worth $215 billion. When you look back at the last 15 years, last 15 years have shown 755 uh, business jets delivered. When you look at the forecast that we've put out, we're optimistic and starting to see signs. What are those signs? Well, it starts with pre-owned deliveries. The deliveries are up five times that of new, new aircraft. When you see pre-owned activities up, that strengthens the price points. When you start strengthening the price points, the residual values for the shareholders, for the buyers, starts to improve as well. That's very good signs for us. So when you see uh, pre-owned inventories declining and price points starting to stabilize, that's a bright future for us. Mr. Amalfitano, it's Kelly back here uh, in New York. I'm just wondering because Hi, GE just made a big deal. Hi. Uh, GE just made a big deal of getting rid of its corporate jet fleet because it said it couldn't, you know, it wasn't the kind of perk that the company needed right now. Isn't that sort of a high profile example of why demand is still weak? No, what's interesting about the circumstances around the marketplace right now is you have to make decisions that are right for each organization. And you have to buy an asset that allows for you to deliver for your shareholders. So our aircraft have the highest benefit of utilization in the marketplace at a low operating cost. So we're solutions for flight departments. Lower net present values, lower operating costs, higher dispatch reliabilities allows flight departments to be able to operate efficiently. Michael, let me ask you about air taxis. Earlier this year, mm -hmm. Embraer said it would partner with Uber in terms of developing air taxis in the future. And a lot of people are talking about how quickly will we see this in cities like Dallas or Dubai or New York or, or any of these cities. Give us an, an accurate portrayal of terms of how far out in the future until we actually see these air taxis. Well, it's a great question, and we're so excited to be a part of it. We brought the Embraer Innovation Center to Melbourne, Florida. That's the um, essence of where we're going to start doing the innovation for technologies such as this. Innovation is where it's at when it comes to Embraer. We, that's how we believe you can start to develop the ecosystem that's necessary to, to, to look at those kinds of new models. But we're excited about the new Phenom 300E that we're delivering here, and the reason why it speaks to the, so, the social demographics that are necessary for those ecosystems like Uber Elevate. Smaller so we have an traveling. aircraft that serves the uh, profile of that um, de demographic very nicely. Right price point, economical, 
high utilization because you're going to need something that flies lots of hours. So the Phenom 300E, best-selling jet with the 300. We now introduced its enhanced version here at the show. We're excited. Hope you can come by static display and take a look at it. But that's what's going to motivate the, uh, the benefits is to try to develop the ecosystem with the right asset. And we're hoping that that has opportunity for us in the future. Michael Amalfitano, the CEO of Embraer Aviation. Uh, on the lineage, uh, I, I would get on the Phenom, but I think we'd be a little, little, little tighter quarters, if you would, than where we are now. Well, it's interesting. The, the, like I said, there's lots more space here. But even our Phenom 300, we've added three more inches in aisle space, another inch in headroom. Very exciting, spacious to the light jet. First in its class, best in time. Thank you, Michael. Fantastic, Kelly, Phil. Back to you. Take care. Have Thank a great day. Thank you both. You too. Phil fits comfortably in there. With six, seven, I think we decided uh, you were <laughs> Phil. Uh, anyway, thank you both very much. Michael Malfitano and her own Phil LeBeau. Uh, pharma companies are thinking about raising drug prices, but they may be thinking twice after a new bill signed in California today. We will have those details next. We're also just hours away from the Procter & Gamble shareholder meeting. $60 million has already been spent in the battle over a boardroom seat for activist Nelson Peltz. What the outcome could mean. California Governor Jerry Brown signing a bill earlier today that doesn't sit very well with pharmaceutical companies and could have a big impact on health care policy. Meg Terrell has those details for us. Meg? Hey, Kelly. Well, California's new drug pricing law doesn't go so far as to control the price of drugs. What it does is require drug companies to provide notification of planned price hikes 60 days in advance. In signing the bill earlier today, Governor Jerry Brown noted what he said was an increasing economic divide between the haves and the have-nots. Californians have a right to know why, why their medical costs are out of control, especially when the pharmaceutical profits are soaring. The requirement applies to drug price hikes of more than 16 percent over a two-year period. The law also requires justification of the hikes and mandates that health insurers report information about their drug spending. And price increases of this magnitude aren't uncommon at all. I was just speaking with Professor Walid Jalad at the University of Pittsburgh, who pointed out we saw a price increase on one of Celgene's drugs just today that brings its total to 30 percent in the past two years. And that's very in line with what we see throughout the industry. Jalad says the hope is a law like this will dissuade Wade drug makers from taking such large price increases, but he said it could backfire and that companies may just set the initial prices higher. And the drug industry said it was disappointed Governor Brown signed the bill, pointing out it only applies to list prices and doesn't shed light on the rebates and discounts paid to insurance companies and pharmacy benefits managers. Kind of that same back and forth we're used to seeing here, Kelly. I'd appreciate if you could shed more transparency on that whole part of the market <laughs> from the list price to the final price, but uh, I suppose he's focused on uh, the headline number. Meg, thank you very much. Thank you. Our Meg Terrell. A key vote tomorrow for one of retail investors' most widely held stocks in the market. We have details on what's becoming one of the most expensive shareholder fights ever next. And then coming up on Fast Money, earnings season about to kick off later this week. One strategist will tell us what to expect this time around. And there's more Closing Bell right after this. The long-awaited Procter & Gamble shareholder meeting is tomorrow, and so is the vote to give activist Nelson Peltz a seat on the board, and the battle is shaping up to be one of the most expensive shareholder wars ever. Leslie Picker is here with more. Hey, Leslie. Hey, Kelly. That's right. $60 million. That's how much Nelson Peltz and Procter and & Gamble are spending on this fight. $60 million over one board seat. The company is estimating it will spend $35 million, and Nelson Peltz's firm Tryon said it would spend $25 million. This is likely to be the most costly proxy fight ever. And one reason why it's added up so quickly on both sides is that P&G has a lot of individual shareholders. Retail investors make up 40 percent of P&G's shareholder base. That's about four times the proportion of an average company, which has about 11, 10 percent retail. This is important because outreach to dentists and day traders, it's expensive, inefficient and old fashioned. Both sides have paid people to work the phones and send letters, which cost money to print and mail. And Peltz has waged a large advertising campaign in Cincinnati with ads in local papers, on local TV, to appeal to those retail investors in P&G's hometown. Peltz learned about this the hard way. He learned not to discount the importance of retail. In 2015, DuPont became the first and only fight he's ever lost. About one-third of DuPont's shareholder base was retail, which largely sided with the company. And 
when the index funds also voted in favor of management, DuPont won that fight. So the question now, will we see a repeat of 2015 or will the vote go the other way? We'll find out tomorrow, Kelly. The other thing is people have said, you know, Procter & Gamble is taking a lot of these steps on its own to be more activist with a new CEO. The Journal today says the company ha uh, hopes its redemption lies in a koala-shaped maxi pad. Yeah, this is really, really important because one of the big uh, setbacks that people point to with P&G is what it did with diapers in China several years ago. Lost a bunch of share, right? Lost a bunch of share. They put out a lower cost product thinking that the Chinese, the middle class Chinese would go for the cheaper diapers. But the Chinese, they wanted to spend money. They saw diapers as a luxury. And so the same here with this maxi pad. They're trying this strategy and it seems to be working already in China. I, I can't believe we're actually, that. there it is everybody. This is the koala shaped maxi pad from Procter <laughs> & Gamble Whisper brand uh, aimed at teenagers in China. This is what happens when Mike is gone. Quite a hit. <laughs> <laughs> right. I wish he was here afternoon. just to have to be part of this comfortable conversation, Leslie. <laughs> uh, regardless of which way it goes tomorrow, we'll see what direction the company takes. Thank you so much. Thank you. Uh, Leslie Picker. Coming up, a new segment we are calling The Closing Word. Today's closing word is irrational, and I'll explain why after the break.